all across Europe. Latter-day Saints hold strong to their beliefs. Our parents taught us that, you know, we're special. Western Europe played a major role in the growth and success of the church from the beginnings in the 1830s well into the 20th century. When you are a Mormon in Germany, you are very devoted. Honoring that pioneer heritage, members today move forward with faith to face challenges and help those most in need. The opportunity is there to come to understand that these refugees are people like you and me. New temples stand as monuments to the church's growth. Now we're here in front of the Rome temple in the uh, center of the European and traditional Christianity here. The beauty of Europe, of music, and of faith all combine in the Mormon Tabernacle Choir's historic tour. Spreading hope through music, service, and assurance in an uncertain world. I know that there's a Heavenly Father. I know that there's Jesus Christ. Join us for Faith, Hope, and Charity, Latter-day Saints in Europe. In 1455, here in Mainz, Germany, Johannes Gutenberg first printed and mass-produced the Bible. It was therefore available to the masses. Not far from here, the first congregation of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints was organized in 1843. There are now 166 congregations and nearly 40,000 members in Germany, many of them second, third, and fourth generation members of the church. And these are people that worked here during this time, most of them members of the church. 19-year-old Hanna Gruza is a third-generation member on both sides of her family. She lives with them in Berlin. I graduated from high school and I'm serving as a service missionary right now in the Germany Berlin Mission Office. Hanna was born with spinal muscular atrophy. A couple of years ago, she appeared in a German reality show. How they are still normal and how they can still be do and just be a regular person, a regular teenager. For her audition, Hannah had to sing a song that described her, and she chose a song she'd known since childhood. Ich bin ein kind von God. Her mother, waiting just outside the audition room, couldn't believe what she was hearing. Ich bin ein kind von God. Ist sie denn verrückt? Das kann sie hier nicht machen. Aber als ich danach gedacht habe, ich gedacht, sie ist so, so stark. Sie traut sich, sie hat so viel Mut. The person recording Hannah's audition was moved by the song. She could just see how much I believed in Christ and how much um, the gospel influenced me. The gospel and music, both big influences in the Cruza home. Julie Kruse remembers listening to the Mormon Tabernacle Choir every Sunday. Und wenn diese Platte gespielt wurde, wussten wir jetzt ist Sonntag, egal wie groß wir waren, egal wie alt. And to hear them perform live in Berlin. A dream come true for Julie and Hannah. I really love the music and the spirit that they bring when they sing. in Berlin's historic Philharmonie Concert Hall. The words to this song held deep meaning for the audience and choir members. The walls of, of Jericho falling down in Berlin. John Mueller was a missionary in Berlin when the wall came down on November 9, 1989. And we saw all of that unfold. We were right there being able to stand on the east side of the Brandenburg Gate and see the statue uh, from the front that was it caught me off guard a little bit because I didn't I had never seen it from that side before yeah I remember the guard towers when I was here in 79 Dave Fisher saw the other side of the wall during a visit to his grandmother's home in East Berlin in the 1970s my mother and father from Berlin and um, I can't even tell you the feelings and emotions that are in me that I'm actually here singing in there their town where they were born and grew up. The Grunwalds have lived through much of Berlin's transformation. In one moment, we uh, 
stood up on, on Sunday morning and it was announced that the East put up the, the wall of barbed wire. Gerhard Grunwald was a student on the West Side when the Berlin Wall went up, cutting him off from his family. My older brother, my younger sister, and my mother with their families. That wall separated thousands of families. At that time, many of the German Latter-day Saints lived on the east side. New wards had to be organized, and additional missionaries were also called to West Berlin. That was to, to make, give us a spirit of, and hope that Berlin will not die, but will grow. And the church in West Berlin did grow, but members who remained on the east side feared they would never receive the blessings of the temple. So I always had this testimony, they, the Father in heaven will give them the temple. And we, we know that President Monson had dedicated this country President Monson and other church leaders established relationships with high government officials and began building bridges, which led to the remarkable construction of a Latter-day Saint temple in Freiburg, Germany, behind the Iron Curtain. I asked him about that at his first news conference as president. And I'm very, very happy that those who have been deprived of coming across the borders to a temple of God would have a temple in their own midst. In September 2016, the Freiberg Temple was rededicated for a second time. When this temple was built, I personally thought it might come sometime when my grandchildren are grown up. And then overnight, it was here. The rededication of that temple was especially poignant to John Mueller. He and his companion were among the first missionaries transferred into East Germany. His mother, born and raised in Germany, was among those who helped foster relationships between the church and the East German government. She said, you know, I told them that in our articles of faith, the government that we were to adhere to the laws of the land. And I think she said because of that, it was the, the East German government was very receptive because they knew that people there would be um, would still be willing to follow the government. She was also a member of the Mormon Tabernacle Choir. She loved to sing and, and music was kind of her thing, but she said, when I grow up, I'm gonna live in Salt Lake City and I'm gonna sing in that choir. John felt prompted to join the choir after his mother passed away. And when he heard the choir would be touring in Germany. As that announcement was made, kind of a, <laughs> Uh, warm hug from my mom. Mueller's family history came full circle on this tour. It was very difficult to sing without be, uh, being emotional. He and his mother both proselyting as missionaries and musicians to the German people. You can bear your testimony through music because it's, it's just another way that our, that our hearts receive inspiration and that we feel the, the light of the gospel. In 2012, choir president Ron Jarrett and his wife Lucy were serving a mission in Germany when they received a call from President Monson for him to lead the choir. My wife made the comment, President, we're loving our mission. Couldn't we stay to the end of our mission? And he said, no. President Uffdorf can tell you how hard it is to leave Germany. From the time he received that call, it was President Jarrett's dream and goal to bring the choir back to Europe. This is a personal touch to the lives of people around the world, but right now in Germany and Belgium and Holland and wherever we're going, it's, it's that personal touch that we can bring, that you're loved, we care about you, and for us, wow, they're really there. We really can sing to them. We in particular have been looking forward to joining you tonight. 
First Alto, Sonia Poulter, was born and raised near Frankfurt. She was thrilled to bring her Utah and German families together. And I know Sonia has really been looking forward to coming tonight to this concert. Das stimmt. Das shows having a father's love for his members all over. And right now, especially for the people in Europe here. Frankfurt, Germany, was destroyed during World War II and, like many cities here, rose from the ashes. Latter-day Saints say they also recognize the power of the gospel in rebuilding lives. This church got actually pretty heavily damaged in, during World War II. Andy Krause grew up in Nuremberg. The bells and the towers came down on the last day of war. And knows the city's history well. We can see the devastating destruction, the meaningless destruction of a whole beautiful city, actually. But Krause says you can also see the power of rebirth. So they rebuilt the city here from the ashes, and we can also rebuild ourselves. Krause, a single father, rebuilt his life when he joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints seven years ago. I'm a completely different person. I'm a happier person now. Although he is happier, Krause's family remains skeptical of his new faith. But his mother did agree to attend the Mormon Tabernacle Choir's concert in Nuremberg with her son. In the beginning, she was a little bit superstitious about that, and uh, it's more, it says Mormon, and we had that agreement, and you know, and I said, yes, but it's an awesome choir, and you will love it. <laughs> the choir performed at Meister Singahala, located next to an infamous park in history, the Nazi Party Rally Grounds. And it's very peaceful here to look at, but at one time it was a huge ground where hundreds of thousands of people stood and in attention and, and Hitler had all of his famous speeches here that got the German people uh, to rally behind him. Choir members say standing where Hitler stood was chilling. It's, a, it's an odd uh, mixing of peace and and terror from the past. Scott Miller's grandfather served as mission president in Czechoslovakia in 1939. And on August 23rd, the Czech mission received the directive to evacuate. Everyone got out except for President Toronto and four of his missionaries. And my grandmother, who was the mission mother, was very upset about uh, the war. Then Elder Joseph Fielding Smith, who was in Europe conducting the annual tour of missions, made this prophetic promise. He prophesied to her that uh, the war with Germany would not start until the missionaries and my grandfather, the mission president, uh, were out of Czechoslovakia and safe. President Toronto and his missionaries boarded the last ferry to cross from Germany to Denmark. That same day, Germany invaded Poland, the event that is generally regarded as the beginning of World War II. To be on these grounds makes me feel the enormity of the history. That history continues to have an impact on Latter-day Saints in Germany. Richard Marx and his family lived in Dresden during the war. They escaped with only their lives during the fire bombings. More than 70 years later, those memories are still devastating. It's calm. When we go to the streets of Dresden, the roofs came down, and yes, it was horrible and we lost all that we had. Afterwards, his mother took him and his sisters to a small village where Latter-day Saints helped them with food, shelter, clothing, everything. When his father returned from the war and learned of the generosity of church members, he permitted his children to join the faith. Harta Marx's mother joined the faith first, but she says her father investigated the church for seven years until, in 1936, he had the opportunity to visit with President Heber J. Grant. In Berlin to visit, um, the prophet came to Berlin for a visit and he heard the talk from him. Er hatte ein Privatgespräch mit ihm. Oh, he has a personal talk to him. <laughs> when Richard and Harta married and started a family, they made the life-changing decision to escape from East to West Germany. They risked everything to do it. In this, gefängnis und unser kind kommt weg. this decision was hard because we knew if someone picked up or saw that we were going to the border, they would bring us to the police and they would take our kids away and we would not see them anymore. Sabine Himiopen is their daughter. Her husband Arne joined the church after their marriage. 
Sabine says he must have gone through a busload of missionaries. But what happened to Arna happens to many people around the world. He felt the spirit and he felt the Holy Ghost. And that is what he brought to the, to the church. Sylvia Nassauer became a Latter-day Saint in February of 2016. Thanks to a chance discovery of the Piano Guys on YouTube. It was so touching that I really had a breakdown. So I, I call it a healing breakdown now. So I found um, an email address from Stephen Sharp Nelson. And um, yeah, he also reminded me of my brother who died a few years ago. And so I just I, I write him. Stephen Sharp Nelson referred the missionaries to Sylvia, and they gave her the Book of Mormon. I think I can say um, it saved my life. <laughs> Christian and Verena Nabrotsky were born and raised in the church. Their parents were converts. His grandfather, he says, was a supporter of the Third Reich. He was um, a Nazi, basically, yeah? And when, when uh, the, the war was lost, basically his whole life um, fell apart. After the war, his uncles moved to Canada, where President Monson was a mission president. They joined the church. Christian's father heard about this strange religion his brothers had joined and traveled there to bring them back to Germany. He found out uh, how family life was uh, with his brother's uh, families, and he was um, still baptized over in Canada, came back as a Mormon. Christian has served as a bishop. Verena served a mission on Temple Square, where she taught many of her countrymen. There were a lot of German visitors, a lot in, in the summer, and they came um, with no clue about the church. So we had a good um, opportunity to tell them. The Nabrotskis say Latter-day Saints should never take their faith for granted. Really dive into into, into the church and, um, well, enjoy, you know, the, the abundance of church life around you. So that's something that we don't have here in Germany. This group of Latter-day Saints is a small representation of the past, the current strength, and the future of this faith in Germany. Vienna, known as the city of music. The greats, Beethoven, Mozart, and Brahms, all composed and conducted here. Today, you can enjoy everything from classical to modern music at venues all over the city. And it is here that Latter-day Saint Henrietta Lerchkiel perfects her craft. Actually, I never e really thought about becoming a violin maker. Henrietta's talents reflect her parents' talents. So my father is a sculptor. And her mother is a singer with a strong following in Vienna. <laughs> and it's just amazing how much, yeah, how much love and energy she develops on stage. Both parents are converts to the church, and Henrietta says they taught her and her siblings to appreciate how their faith set them apart from the rest of society. What some people aspire to was never an option for us. You know, it was always like, well, you have your beliefs, you don't follow what other people do. You have to think for yourself. Today, there are nearly 5,000 Latter-day Saints in Austria. Because the wards are smaller, members here are especially close. It just has, it really has a family feeling. Liz Yevich Sumlai joined the church in Vienna as a young girl after her family fled the war in Serbia. Her mother died soon after they arrived, leaving her father alone with two children and very little means to care for them. When he found the church, he says he found hope. Finally you see uh, uh, coming some light, something like light, small, but it's there. Liz's husband, Chaba, joined the church in Hungary. He remembers the first time Latter-day Saint missionaries came to his parents' house. And I saw two huge missionaries. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> covering the whole doorstep, 
and they were just shining. Chaba just received his master's degree studying the clarinet at BYU. He has seen the Mormon Tabernacle Choir perform before, but seeing them in Vienna was a remarkable experience. It is a hallmark for a church and for also for the members um, to hear um, the gospel in that way. Kojen Mao has never heard the choir perform live. I was so excited yesterday. I didn't sleep well because I just want to come, come here. Born in Taiwan, he came to Vienna to study conducting. It was the Mormon Tabernacle Choir, he says, that actually influenced his decision to study music. He hopes to use his talents to spread the gospel in Taiwan and China. I love the spirit when people united together. European audiences have a great love for and appreciation of classical music, and Mac Wilberg knows that. So when he was creating the program for this concert tour, he very much kept it in mind. Who would have thought that one would be, have the opportunity of performing in that, again, very historic uh, hall? The famed Musikverein in Vienna is considered one of the finest concert halls in the world. And Austrian journalists were especially struck by how the choir sounded here. We do not hear that, that kind of music very often here. It's very emotional. You really get emotional when you hear this choir. One of our uh, charges is to be the very best we can be, but also sing for people. Wilberg had warned the choir and orchestra not to expect standing ovations and the thunderous applause, typical of an American audience, on this tour. None of us knew quite what to expect in that regard, but uh, we were pleasantly, and have been pleasantly surprised the entire tour. The choir also met super fans. Trevor Clark from Melbourne, Australia is not a Latter-day Saint, but he traveled to be with the choir at four of their European concerts. The whole thing is just so inspirational, I love it. To be in those great venues with the German people uh, and to hear them go absolutely wild with enthusiasm for, for what they're hearing, great. Clark has corresponded with announcer Lloyd Newell for years. Most of the letters I get are from non-LDS people that write me and say, I've grown up listening to this choir, or listening to the broadcast, or they want a copy of a message or a song that touched their heart. Michael Stein brought an autograph book he made especially for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir concert. And the chance to sing with the choir was a birthday wish come true. It's a, a fantastic choir. It's, it's very, very fine to sing on my birthday. <laughs> okay, we're, we're going to Europe. Figure it out. Pooling this tour together was no easy feat. I spent about six months just researching halls uh, and, and laying out a route. Tour manager Barry Anderson spent four years planning logistics. Everything you see on the stage I had to ship here. He also spent a lot of time on his knees. Heavenly Father, I don't know how we're going to do this part. What do I do? And answers would come. There were seemingly endless challenges, but Anderson says seeing audience reaction night after night made it all worth it. I saw this, this lady with her young children, and she just had this look on her face like, it was so peaceful, like, that's us. And mouthed every word to every hymn and uh, so you know that that's a pretty neat thing that we're able to do that for the, the members here. One of the biggest challenges facing Western Europe right now, the mass migration of millions of refugees fleeing the horrors of war in the Middle East. Parks and fairgrounds in Frankfurt and other German cities have become havens for refugees. But it's more than the government offering support. The German people have stepped forward to help them. Nicole Ludwig voluntarily runs a refugee camp located near her home in Frankfurt and says many refugees are afraid to integrate. 
If you know the stories, you can also understand why they don't want to go outside. Standing shoulder to shoulder with her are American expats Tricia Limer and Melissa Bradford. I was like, you're from the Latter-day Saints. <laughs> and it was like, hi, how, how do you know? I said, uh, because I, in my youth, I've been spending a lot of time with, uh, with people from the church. Nicole even spent a summer living in Ogden, Utah. You were sent from heaven, so uh, we are happy to have them here and helping us out. That was, that's awesome, yeah. Melissa and Tricia have also started a project documenting the personal stories of each refugee humanizing a crisis that is often talked about in sweeping generalizations. When they become human beings and you know their stories, you are changed. You know that you aren't talking about an other, you're talking about your brother and your sister. Some of the women that I have gotten to know who are examples of everything that I want to be as a mother. Each refugee has a deep personal story of hope, courage, and loss. I miss my parents, my sister, brothers, my whole family. Ali Ahmadzai crossed the border of Afghanistan under a blanket of gunfire with one of his sisters in 2015. They left so that both could secure a better future and send for the rest of their family. Women, they don't, they don't have freedom. Nothing. Nothing. It's nil, zero. Milan Tumuri also fled Afghanistan and traveled by small boat to Greece with 53 people. It was so dangerous. It was around 95 percent to die. He has seven children, but could only bring his youngest to Germany. When I look into the eyes of a father who's separated from his children, and a mother who is separated from her husband, and a community that is taken away from their culture, I connect with that. We don't have to look back far in our history to reflect on times when we were refugees. During General Conference in April 2016, Elder Kieran reminded Latter-day Saints that the stories of today's refugees This money will be used specifically to provide food to refugees in Cameroon, Chad, and Syria. I can only say thank you, thank you, thank you to our members who are so dedicated. President Uchtdorf came to Rome personally to make the donation because feeding refugees is very close to his heart. I've been a refugee twice in my life. I know how it feels to be looked down onto. While in Europe, President Uchtdorf visited a refugee camp in Greece. He saw Latter-day Saints joining with people of other faiths, or NGOs, providing relief. As individual families going out, inviting people in their home, uh, visiting with them, helping them to learn the language. So I tip my hat to these wonderful individuals. It's made me very thankful. Thankful to have something to give but also thankful to have these examples, to, to be able to have touched lives, have their lives touch mine. Missionary work in Switzerland began in 1850, and today there are more than 9,000 members of the church who live here. Most people do not know much about the faith, but they certainly did pay attention to the publicity surrounding the Mormon Tabernacle Choir concert. Billboards like this appeared in train stations. On the major Swiss TV, we had a couple of uh, advertisements. Lifelong Latter-day Saints Bastian and Maya Schaefer jumped at the chance to bring their children. We were sure to make it possible to come. And they made sure to invite family and friends who are not Latter-day Saints. I respect it and I really feel happy when they go to church or talk about it. and. You see the, the fire in their eyes that they really 
They really live for that. The Oswalds also view the concert as a missionary opportunity. They can listen to the choir and this universal language, which is music, which can touch their spirits. Daniel Oswald joined the church in Switzerland when he was 19. He met his wife, Tamara, an American, while her father presided over the Switzerland Zurich mission. Spiritual and romantic memories. They now live in Utah, and Daniel is the honorary consul of Switzerland here. Tamara plays the harp for the Mormon Tabernacle Choir and Orchestra at Temple Square. This tour has given them both the chance to reconnect with old friends. All along the way, since the concerts have all been in German-speaking Europe so far, I've had friends and people that I've known for 30-plus years. The Oswalds believe this tour has helped strengthen European members. I think it says you are really important. You're really important. You're part of the fold. Those in the audience say they felt that love. So I tell my wife, this must be the music when the resurrection is going to be. And I brought my whole family, and uh, most of them are not active or not in the church, uh, especially the, uh, the sisters, the, the, the wives-in-law and everything, and they really like it. It's a great joining of hearts. It's a joining of love and, and a unifying effect on everybody, not just church members, but everyone leaves having had an, an enriching experience which brings all of us together. Elder Clayton presided over the choir and orchestra while they were on tour, and he and Sister Clayton saw firsthand how hearts were changed. He could hardly wait for the applause to subside so that he could speak to me personally, which he did, hardly able to speak, and said, the Mormons know God? Such a thing I had never imagined. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir has helped foster many interfaith relationships. Pastor Schmidt became a fan of the choir at age six when he stumbled upon their radio broadcast on American Forces Network. From the Crossroads of the West, Music and the Spoken Word was the title then, and uh, I was hooked from the first day. He says he has long admired the church's missionary efforts. And that's not what's going on in our churches. That's why we lose so many members. Many religious leaders, dignitaries, and government officials were invited to the concerts. The Prime Minister of the Netherlands attended because he has a special tie to the choir. His niece is a member. He immediately went and bought tickets for himself and for some of our other family members, which I am so thrilled about. I am just so thrilled that they're going to be able to come and hear the choir and see and hear what fills me with so much joy. Rebecca Farnsworth visited her mother's family in Holland often as a child and considered it a great blessing to be able to return with the choir. It is incredible for me to think that we can go to Holland and sing for these amazing Dutch saints and people. Today, there are 9,000 Latter-day Saints in the Netherlands, and they were thrilled when the choir sang a Dutch rendition of God be with you till we meet again. That song meant a great deal to Rebecca. Her mother passed away in 1998. She always wished there was more singing in the world. And I feel like when I'm in the choir, that I am actually giving a very special gift to, just to her. And that to me really, really is special. Brussels, Belgium, a city still healing from the horrors of a terrorist attack. The Mormon Tabernacle Choir came here to deliver a message of hope. Brussels is considered the heart of Europe, full of tourists, and the citizens here are determined to get back to life as normal after the terrorist attack at the airport. Latter-day Saints in particular are very grateful that the Mormon Tabernacle Choir decided to go forward with its plans for a concert here. Francesco De Lillo heads the European Union office for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. The people we work with, the um, representatives of the institutions, uh, government leaders, uh, they will have a chance to 
to hear and uh, watch the choir, uh, some of them for the first time. The church first gained national attention in Belgium in 1936, when a Latter-day Saint-sponsored basketball team defeated the Belgian national championship team to become the unofficial Belgian champions. In March 2016, the church again found itself in the spotlight, but this time under tragic circumstances. The bomb blast from a terrorist attack at the airport injured four Latter-day Saint missionaries. In, in the midst of that tragedy, uh, I really realized how the church is an international family. Francesco was serving in a Latter-day Saint bishopric at the time and says church members spent the day going from hospital to hospital trying to locate Elder Mason Wells, Elder Joseph Empey, Sister Fanny Klen, and senior missionary Elder Richard Norby. All we knew uh, was that um, they were alive, but we didn't know the, their conditions. The missionaries say they each experienced miracles that day. I don't have any recollection of any pain. And so that goes in the miracle column. The first one is that I'm still alive. The second one was then I was, um, they took care of me really fast. I wasn't in the hospital too long, and I was able to go back on the mission fast. All of this are a miracle. They now live with gratitude in their hearts, but also question why they survived when dozens of others did not. I feel really blessed to be alive today, and we've been praying for those families who have lost loved ones. Joseph Empey, Mason Wells, and Richard Norby served as Grand Marshals of the Provo Parade on July 4th. Sister Fanny Klen is now serving her mission in Ohio. They are forever linked, they say, by this miracle and they refuse to live in fear. Because I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor. And a terrorist want to instill terror. I refuse to be terrorized. With the challenges facing Europeans now, the choir tour delivered a particularly strong embrace. 320 choir members, nearly 70 members of the orchestra, all, all touring Europe. Yes, it's a big message to the members and it's a big message to the to the rest of the world who's looking in, that, that we're a church that's here to stay and, and making a valuable contribution. And hopefully for those who need some healing in this area, this will be part of that for them. Assistant Choir Director Ryan Murphy says conducting in Brussels in particular was an emotional experience for him. I'm half Belgian. Je suis un des conducteurs du Chœur du Tabernacle. Hello. My name is Maria Murphy. Ryan's mother Maria was born and raised in Belgium. I love, I love my language, I love my roots, I love my relatives. Well, I have about 12 family members coming tonight, so I'm very excited to have some family in the audience. This tour was an opportunity for many choir members to reconnect with their roots. Choir and orchestra stand now if you have family connections or some kind of roots to Europe. We're just excited to be here and to, to partake of the great culture here and the people's goodness here. The City of Lights is known for its iconic architecture, cultural institutions, and French flair. Relics of a deep spiritual heritage tower the skyline, but today Paris stands as one of the more secular cities in the world. I am the only member of the church where I'm studying, um, so I'm, I'm used to, but uh, for sure sometimes it's, you, you know that you're different. Abish Martin is studying fashion and marketing in Paris. I did my mission here in Paris. She comes from a Latter-day Saint family of eight children. They are among the nearly 38,000 French citizens who are Latter-day Saints. For years, they have traveled to England or Germany or Switzerland or Spain to attend the temple. Soon, they will have one in France. For me, it's really a miracle that we have a temple here. The temple site is not far from one of the country's biggest tourist attractions. Versailles is one of the most famous palaces in the world. Just a mile from here, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints has built its first temple in France. President Monson announced the plans to build it in 2011. Construction began in 2013, and dedication may happen in mid-2017. We 
avoid it with faith. Uh, we had a few prophets who came to announce that one day it would be possible. So this day has come. Bruno Grenier is a former bishop and lifelong Latter-day Saint. His parents were converts. Uh, my dad was looking for the truth, and uh, my mom was grateful for what the American soldiers had done to free us. We used to have all the activities for the young women. Uget Tonnerre lives next door to the new temple and attends church just a few blocks away. I have two older sisters and a little brother. She was born and raised as a church member in France. Her parents were converts who met as young single adults. Following her patriarchal blessing, she decided to serve a mission and first received a call to Temple Square. But two weeks before leaving, that call changed to the visitor center at the St. George Temple. I was really scared that I will be in the middle of nowhere. She soon learned that 20,000 French visitors tour Utah's national parks every year, and many come to the visitor center. At first, they thought that I was American, just knowing really well French. So I had to tell them, no, I'm, I'm really French. And um, they were really surprised, yes. They were like, but why are you a Mormon? Why didn't you stay Catholic? Though they arrived skeptical, Uget says most European visitors left with a new understanding and even appreciation for the Latter-day Saint faith. And I just loved how they left with a, a big smile usually and a lot of thank you and um, it was an amazing experience. There are 11 operating Latter-day Saint temples in Europe with three more under construction. While the temple stands as a beacon of light and hope, President Uchtdorf says it should not be seen as seeking recognition, but simply making a statement of what this church stands for. The Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is truly the Church of Jesus Christ. We met President and Sister Uchtdorf at the Rome, Italy temple site. On 15 acres, there are four buildings. The temple, which can be seen from the Beltway exit. It will be a striking edifice with its double spires. The visitor center, a stake center, and housing for temple patrons. When you think about it, in 1955, just 60 years ago, the first temple in Switzerland was built. Now we're here in front of the Rome <laughs> temple in the uh, center of the European and traditional Christianity here. The visitor center will have full-length windows in the front where guests will see the Christus statue, a replica of the one on Temple Square in Salt Lake. And just like the church in Denmark, where Bertel Thorvaldsen's original sculpture is, the visitor center will have marble statues of 11 apostles and Paul, who came to Rome to proclaim the gospel. And then came the restoration. And the restoration of the gospel of Jesus Christ has a culminating point now with the temple approaching completion here in Rome. All over Europe, Latter-day Saints hold true to their faith at a time when organized religion is fading away from European society. You get a lot of interesting questions from people. They say, oh, you're Mormon. Oh tell me about it, and then you start talking about what we believe in. It is not always an easy journey. You really have to be sure that your testimony is your testimony. But they draw strength from each other. Members of the church here are have an incredible faith. I know that, that the gospel like supposed to give us hope, that I know that there's no reason to have fear. And carry faith, hope, and charity in their hearts. And uh, I can only say, press forward, which means really trust in the Lord, keep his commandments, and be strong in the gospel, and this will build the future for them. Yeah.